Um, before we get started, we would like to note that as a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskakia, the Piankashaw, the Wea, the Miami, the Mascoutin, the Odawa, the Sauk, the Meskwaki, the Kikapu, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these Native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution with Native peoples at the core of our efforts. Um, and I would like to now welcome our speaker. Um, Stephen Dewan Booth is currently archive manager of the Johnson Publishing Company Archive for the Getty Research Institute, where he leads a staff of seven archivists who are responsible for cataloging and conserving the more than four million items in the collection. He has a BA in music from Morehouse College and a Master of Sciences in Library Science from Simmons College. From 2009 to 2021, Stephen worked at the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration for the Presidential Materials Division, Office of Presidential Libraries, and the Barack Obama Presidential Library. He is also currently a member of the Steering Committee for the Archives Leadership Institute at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. In 2020, Stephen co-edited with Stacey Williams' Lost Capture Volume 1, The State of Black Cultural Archives, a digital editorial project exploring the state of black cultural archives in and beyond Chicago, presented by 60 Inches from Center, a Chicago-based arts publication and archiving initiative. He is currently working on a new book project with Barry E. Brown, documenting the history and impact of the Archivists and Archives of Color member affinity group, which is under co contract with the Society of American Archivists, commonly known as SAA Publications. And he is also a co-PI on the Archival Revolutions Project with Brenda Gunn, funded by the SAA Founda Foundation, which explores transitional shifts in the archival profession from 1980 to 2020. They will be publishing their research findings in 2024 as part of the CLEAR or Council on Library and Information Resources Pocket Burgundy series. Stephen, we are so glad you are here and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen, you all. All right, I think you all can see that okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, Kate, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to uh, the Lecture Series Committee for uh, extending this invitation to discuss the Johnson Publishing Company Archive and the work the Getty Research Institute is doing in partnership with the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, I also like to thank those behind the scenes, such as Carrie Lingshit and others who have uh, graciously assisted and provided administrative and technical support um, in order to make this event possible. Your labor does not go unnoticed. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Mary Miller, who is the director of the Getty Research Institute, and my supervisors, uh, Kara Olich, Associate Director for Collections and Discovery, and Nancy Inneking, Interim Head of Special Collections Management uh, for their continued support of the JPC Archive. And lastly, to my team, colleagues, family, friends, and everyone in the U of I community who are watching, uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to be here. It is much appreciated. Um, and so with that, let's get started. Using his mother's furniture as collateral for a $500 loan, Black businessman John H. Johnson founded Johnson Publishing Company alongside his wife, Eunice Walker Johnson, in November of 1942, beginning with his very first publication, Negro Digest. Following the relative success of this all print magazine, Mr. Johnson began publishing picture magazines starting in November of 1945 with Ebony which was a monthly publication that featured elaborate photographic spreads and in-depth stories and articles. A few years later, in November of 1951, the weekly pocket-sized magazine known as Jet appeared on newsstands. During its peak from the 1960s until the early 2000s, Johnson Publishing Company was the largest Black-owned public company. And in 2019, the changing media landscape prompted JPC to file for liquidation, 
allowing for the reinvention of the historic brand. Under the leadership of Mr. Johnson's daughter, Linda Johnson Rice, JPC has since reemerged as a multimedia and production company. Currently, Bridgman Sports and Media are the owners and publishers of Ebony and Jet magazines. So, whenever Mr. Johnson came across a white magazine with a strong Black readership, he would often create an equivalent using names that captured the color of Black, such as ebony, tan, copper, hue, and jet. In addition to these titles, JPC also published Ebony Man, Ebony Junior, Ebony Africa, Ebony South Africa, Black Stars, Black World, and Beauty Salon. Um, Black Stars would be the magazine that would show behind the scenes um, lives of celebrities and entertainers. So think uh, something similar to like People Magazine today. Um, Ebony Man would be the equivalent of GQ. Um, let's see, Copper Romance, Tan, Confessions and Tan. Uh, those were your more sensationalized um, magazines with stories about um, infidelity um, in relationships. Um, as you can see from this list on the screen, November uh, was often the start month for many of these magazines, and that's because Mr. Johnson considered it to be his lucky month. The magazines catered to readers of all ages and presented to the global Black community an unmatched and unique record of many facets of the life, work, and contributions of Black individuals, communities, groups, organizations, and businesses from the mid-1940s through 2008. And because of this, JPC has and continues to be the topic of countless exhibitions and books and has served as a constant well of inspiration and information for artists, designers, photographers, journalists, and loyal readers. At the time of liquidation in 2019, the archive was purchased jointly by the Smithsonian Institution, the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, and the J. Paul Getty Trust. Since it was acquired um, from JPC, the archive has remained carefully housed here in Chicago. And in 2022, the Foundation Consortium transferred the archive to the sole ownership of the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Getty Research Institute, who share stewardship responsibilities. Additionally, the Getty has committed an initial investment of $30 million to support the conservation, cataloging, and digitization of the collection, along with physical and digital infrastructure, so that it can be made available for public access and research. Within this project, there are over 30 plus experts led jointly by five project managers across the GRI and the MOC who are actively involved and will complete this work collaboratively over seven years uh, from 2022 through 2029. And as a way to build on the expertise of both institutions and to leverage each organization's specific strengths, the work has been uh, divvied up. For example, Getty will take the lead on archival processing, hosting the finding aid, um, item level metadata creation and enhancement, and also provide the primary web discovery and access interface. The Smithsonian is taking a lead on mass digitization of still images, AV digitization and reformatting. Uh, they will also provide the digital asset management system be responsible for digital preservation and provide access to the images and media via IIIF. And both institutions will be responsible for shared technical infrastructure and cross-system integrations. The archive documents the activities of the Johnson Publishing Company, including business records, ephemera, audiovisual materials, and copies of JPC published magazines and books. However, at the heart of the collection are over 4 million prints, negatives, slides, and transparencies depicting the behind the scenes lives of iconic Black entertainers, musicians, fashion models, writers, 
leaders, everyday people, and of course, JPC staffers. The archive provides critical visual documentation of the 20th century Black experience in America. For example, this can be witnessed through the images taken by David Jackson of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old Chicago boy who was lynched by two white men in Mississippi, and Monita Sleet Jr.'s Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of Coretta Scott King at the funeral of her slain husband, Martin Luther King Jr. The collection is made up primarily of published and unpublished photographs taken by the 52 staff photographers and hundreds of freelance photographers and photo agencies. So what we now refer to as the archive was originally known as the Photo Files, which was started by Dora Saunders, the first librarian at JPC. Before going to JPC, Saunders was trained and worked under Vivian G. Harsh at the George Hall branch of the Chicago Public Library. She got the job at JPC by writing Mr. Johnson a letter telling him he needed a, a librarian. So he hired her. She started in the late 1940s, built a team and established the organization and arrangement of the collection. And in the early 1950s, she hired Basil Phillips, who went on to become a photo editor and eventually the manager of the photo files. So consistent with the times, with the standards of the time, the photo files were organized into groupings based on medium, subject, size, and format. Because there was no formal inventory, JPC staff navigated the photo files by perusing the subject headings marked on standard letter size folders and stored vertically in five drawer filing cabinets. And inside the folders, JPC staff would find prints, contact sheets, negatives, and slides related to the subject heading, kept together, um, and would retrieve the materials for their work, and after they were finished, would return those materials back to the file. The collection currently takes up 2,700 linear feet of storage space before cataloging, which is about half a mile worth of material. Within this, there are 1,833 record storage boxes of photographic materials. And the screenshot you see is just a glimpse of our stack space that we are currently occupying. Um, we have retained the original series that was established by Saunders and Phillips, and new ones have been created uh, to group together materials related to other JPC ventures, such as the company itself, Ebony Fashion Fair, Fashion Fair Cosmetics, um, and some of the radio stations. The series arrangement reflects both material and topical groupings, and is currently organized into three main categories, uh, black and white photographs, color photographs, and oversized photographs. And within these three main categories, they are further divided into individuals and subjects. Individuals are organized alphabetically by last name. Individuals featured in JPC publications range across the spectrum of professions, entertainment, media, and society. Included are notable and lesser known persons, organizations and groups within the African-American community and African diaspora. Some individuals have multiple folders with images that are further arranged by event, topic, place, or date. And just a fun fact, um, as of right now, Jesse Jackson actually has the most material. Uh, he has seven boxes worth of photographs. Subjects are organized alphabetically by specific or broad topics. Subjects represent various aspects of African-American history and culture, ranging from organizations, geographic locations, interests, events, and topics. Subjects include churches, television, cartoons, fashion, date with a dish recipes, which was a uh, food column in Ebony, female impersonators, historically black colleges and universities, hunting, integration, the state of Virginia, hairstyles, models who were featured in Tan Magazine, 
the March on Washington, and the NAACP, uh, just to name a few. Subjects do not align with Library of Congress subject headings, and there are some inconsistencies. Uh, for example, photographs of Liberia may be stored in a folder that's titled Africa, comma, Liberia, or just simply Liberia. There is also frequent overlap between individuals and subjects. For example, folders with images of Muhammad Ali or Martin Luther King Jr. document many different events or periods in their lives. And these same individuals may also have folders in the subjects uh, subcategory that relate to them, such as boxing for Ali or Montgomery bus boycott for King. In total, there are 123,311 folders representing individuals, subjects, at, and also JPC's editorial process. So many of the prints have um, on the back the photographer stamp, um, as well as pen and or pencil annotations about the subject. Um, some also have annotations indicating where and when the image was published, um, as well as grease pencil crop and layout markings, as you see on your screen. Many photographs also have captions or related correspondence that's been taped to the back of the image. And more rarely, um, there might be some captions taped on the front. Um, correction fluid appears on some images which was a tactic to modify or uh, Photoshop materials for editorial purposes. Contact sheets uh, may also have grease pencil markings indicating the image that was selected for publication. And a lot of the color photographic materials include a great number of slides in addition to prints, negatives, and transparencies. And as you see on your screen, this folder for Josephine Baker, we have some correspondence. We have uh, some color, a color transparency. There's also a color slide. And at the back of the folder, you also see um, uh, color slide enclosures with slides on the inside. And then on the front folder, the image that's showing on your screen, uh, is a layout um, that they would have done for Jet Magazine with her photograph. Um, here you also see uh, on the left a previously digitized uh, image of James Baldwin and on the right you see um, the cropped image that was actually published in Ebony Magazine um, October 1961 issue. Um, here on the left, you see a digitized image of Tina Turner, and on the right, you see a cropped and flipped image that was published in JET, uh, the September 22nd, 1986 issue on page 54. And so um, these are just examples that show the wide array of content um, and how it is, um, how it, how it's within uh, a working photograph library, a working photo library, excuse me, of this stature and size and really reinforces the historical nature of the archive. And so considering the scope, size and significance of the JPC archive, legal counsel for the GRI and the MOC contractually agreed to a set of priorities and action items which included a condition assessment of the archive followed by processing and digitizing a sample of the collection. Because the GRI and the MOC are based outside of Chicago and because strict travel restrictions were enforced during the COVID-19 pandemic, Krista Lowe, a Chicago-based conservator, was hired in summer 2021 to conduct the actual survey. It was immediately apparent that given the size of the archive, only a sample survey was feasible. So together, uh, Krista and I carefully selected boxes of material to try and capture the breadth of condition related concerns that archivists may encounter as they work through the collection. In total, 
53 boxes and 161 folders were examined in depth. And the survey results revealed that the archive is in good and stable condition. The primary issues uh, identified were related to housing conditions. Many boxes are overcrowded and extremely heavy. Most negatives are currently housed in non-archival enclosures and are often affixed to contact prints with tape or staples. And in some cases, negatives have come loose, leaving adhesive marks or tears. Um, some color slides are sleeved, some are not, and most of the sleeves are non-archival and already undergoing deterioration. In addition, many slides are in their original vendor supplied housing or plastic containers um, within the record storage boxes. What the survey results also reveal was that the collection is both a photographic image archive and the archive of a publishing company. With this knowledge, uh, both the GRI and the MOC agreed that it was important to place equal emphasis on preserving both aspects. This significantly impacts the approach to the preservation of materials in the archive and that the materiality of the archive also bears witness to its working methods. For example, the publishers use the documents and images extensively as working material, while the final product was the publication itself. Um, photographs and documents were handled, annotated, occasionally fastened to other documents, labeled, or even taped together. Materials that are chemically incompatible or have different storage requirements are also often bundled together. With this in mind, the criteria for how to design the processing procedures included the need to stabilize the materials so they are organized and accessible for digitization and research purposes, a strong preference for retaining the materials as they are as evidence of the JPC's working practices when possible, and considerations of time, cost, and scale. Um, extensive interventions on each object is simply not feasible given the size of the archive and the time frame for the project, which is only seven years. At both the GRI and the MOC, archival processing is done in advance of digitization to ensure materials are properly organized and identified with sufficient metadata to manage the resulting digital files. Digitizing unprocessed archives produces disorganized and unidentifiable digital files. With the collection the size of the JPC archive, which will produce millions of digital files, arranging, labeling, and describing materials in advance, it's critical to the success of the digitization aspect of the project and the usability of both the physical and digital material. This is why conducting a pilot to establish and test rehousing and cataloging procedures was of critical importance. Although it is not a common practice for archival collections, done for archival collections at the GRI and the MOC and at most repositories across the country. Um, in preparing for the processing pilot, I used Krista's recommendations and the criteria I mentioned a moment ago to draft an extensive processing manual, which also incorporated archival best practices from the GRI, NAMAC, my previous employers, and other archives and repositories. Also, as part of my preparation, um, I spoke with colleagues at institutions who are also managing large-scale photograph collections, such as the Chicago Sun-Times collection at the Chicago History Museum and the Afro Archives in Baltimore, Maryland, to learn what they are doing. The processing manual outlined the scope of the archival work, which you see on your screen, and also included guidelines for specific tasks um, in order to properly store and rehouse the materials as well as catalog them. So in April and June of 2022, archivist Kit Messick and Laura Struffel from the GRI traveled to Chicago to assist me with a two-part processing pilot. As part of testing and evaluating the efficiency of the rehousing workflows and potential cataloging database, our goal was to process up to 5,000 items at the folder level at the request of our colleagues 
and the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office in order for them to conduct an effective digitization pilot. So rather than counting each individual item in the folder, we casted our net wide and decided to simply rehouse and catalog the first three boxes in the group of oversized photographs of individuals, black and white photographs of individuals, and color photographs of individuals. Um, and we all worked on one box from each of those categories. During the pilot, we were trained by Krista on how to physically handle materials and properly address specific issues related to the condition of the materials. As we worked, we encountered and handled many of the unique, interesting, and challenging issues that were described in the condition assessment survey. This ranged from removing massive quantities of slides and plastic sleeves to detaching negatives and glassine enclosures on the backs of prints. The rehousing process seems simple, but each box was different and is so different. So simplicity and ease was often non-existent. And depending on the complexity of the issues found in the box, an archivist could, sp could spend up to a few days rehousing and another few days cataloging that very same box. Um, in addition to separating materials by format, labeling folders and dividers was time consuming. However, it is a necessary evil in order to preserve provenance and maintain the intellectual integrity of the collection. Creating descriptive metadata at the folder level in A-Space did not present any challenges. Uh, the metadata we captured and will capture includes the subject of the folder, um, the date range of the materials found in the folder, the publications where the photographs appeared, as well as the photographers who are credited with taking the photographs. And we will also include a physical description of the items in the folder. And what you see on your screen is a, is a screenshot of an archive space record for Aaliyah. And on my right, um, where you see collection organization, we've really drilled down to the subject of the folder and then those different formats that are found in the folder. Um, and within those formats, however many folders there are. And so this is how we're maintaining that intellectual integrity uh, to show that at one point, all of these different formats were housed together. So by the end of the pilot, we managed to process a total of eight boxes. Um, this included six record storage boxes that were fully rehoused and partially cataloged, and two flat file boxes that were fully rehoused and partially cataloged. And so the image that you see on your screen, um, that gray box, those gray boxes are the record storage boxes. And from that first uh, gray box, which I believe says BI2, um, we it ended up being two Hollinger boxes, um, one small negative, well, film strip box rather, uh, and three small format uh, photo boxes. Um, underneath that, there's another gray blue box um, which for the color photographs of individuals, and that turned into one Hollinger box, six cartons of um, 35 millimeter slides, uh, one carton of 120 millimeter slides, three small format photo boxes, and two um, film strip boxes. Uh, and then the photograph you see at the bottom is the flat file box for the oversized series. And that turned into um, the first one turned into three clamshell boxes and the second one turned into two clamshell boxes. Um, and on my left, you see uh, what an original box looks like um, and how the contact sheets and the negatives film strips are stored together. And so this is why stabilizing um, each format is of critical importance. And so the number of items processed during the pilot actually exceeded the estimated 5,000 items we needed for the digitization pilot. In fact, a few weeks ago, our digitization colleagues at the Smithsonian announced to the team that we actually processed 9,409 items. 
With the items rehoused during the pilot, we've been able to make some really great projections. Um, at the end of the seven year project, we anticipate uh, once the collection is in proper archival containers, it will expand from half a mile to a little bit over a mile. And that the estimated time of completion for full scale archival processing uh, is four years. So where are we now? Um, prior to the digitization pilot, we made some adjustments and revisions to the rehousing workflows so that certain formats were better stored. For example, the negative film strip boxes that I mentioned on the screen, we're no longer using those. We're now using binders uh, just because it stores the film strips a lot better. Um, we also standardized some of our metadata creation. Uh, we finished cataloging all of the pilot materials, which is great. And uh, we also created an Airtable database to track um, our processing metrics and QC. Um, and right now, as of today, our processing manual is now 185 pages long. Another, another, excuse me, development is that I now have a team of seven. Uh, they include Skyla Hearn, Donna Edgar, Naja Morris, Tulani Pryor, and Jacob Wolf, as well as Jehoiada Cal Calvin. And we are also lucky to have former JPC staffer, Vicki Wilson, who has served as a project consultant since 2019, permanently, permanently on the team as our rights coordinator. Uh, helping to facilitate image licensing and access requests. In addition, we also have David Soule, who is our AV archivist, um, and he is working uh, with the team at NAMAC. And so we knew from the pilot that even for the most experienced archivists, there would be a learning curve to understand JVC workflows, processes, and systems. So ample time was built in to train and accommodate the work and those who are doing the labor. For example, as part of their orientation uh, process, staff were allowed to read the magazines to become familiar with other publications outside of Ebony and Jet. Um, and they were also allowed to just kind of rummage through the collection. So to get a box and open it up and pull out a folder and see what the contents were inside and to learn about so many different people that um, they weren't familiar with. Um, and it was a really great opportunity for them to become comfortable with not only looking through the collection, but also comfortable handling the materials as well. Um, so while this may seem uh, less than ideal, given the time constraints and public interest and curatorial needs, um, it is necessary if the materials are to be properly preserved, digitized, and made accessible. Learning a collection is uh, definitely such a critical part of the process as well. And so the onboarding and training of the team is complete, and the preparation and planning from the pilot has paid off uh, because full-scale archival processing is underway. And in just a few short months, the team has made significant progress on the first, first batch of photographs that they are rehousing and cataloging, uh, which is in the oversized series. And so uh, I guess you are all wondering, when will material be available? Uh, that is a great question. And that has yet to be determined. Um, we are still in the planning and testing stage of the project um, because we really want to ensure that every piece of the project life, life cycle from archiving to digitization to ingest to storage to access through the interface works and that it works well. Oftentimes planning and preparation isn't built into a schedule uh, for large scale projects such as this. So we are really fortunate to be in a position to practice um, what a colleague, uh, Shaitra Powell at UNC Chapel Hill calls slow archives. Um, and, you know, we have the pandemic to thank for that, as horrendous as that experience was, it really gave us the time we needed to um, really think about the work, what we wanted to accomplish, how we wanted to accomplish it, then try and test some of those approaches to see what works best. Um, and this really does speak largely to the GRI's commitment to sustainability and responsible stewardship. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. We do anticipate releasing the finding aid and digitized images, video and audio recordings in phases as the work is completed. And we will share a different, a 
additional information as we finalize our plans. Um, in the meantime, we do encourage everyone who is interested in this project to visit our new Johnson Publishing Company archive resource guide at www.getty.libguides.com slash JPC archive to stay up to date about the project and to check out some of the other awesome and cool JPC related collections at other archives and repositories across the country. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Kate for Q&A. Thank you all. Steven, thank you. That was absolute awesome sauce. Um, it was just so much fun to see all of these images that you have put together and to hear you talk about this work and in, in such detail. Like I'm probably one of like the handful well, this whole room is like going 185 page processing manual. <laughs> yeah. Um, because these are the tools that the this is the reality of our field. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you in the audience, we have a couple of questions already in the Q&A function. Um, I also opened up the chat function. Um, apologies for that being disabled earlier. Um, if you put things um, uh, in the chat, we will go forward. Um, I'm going to... Ooh, we have several raised hands in the audience, but I'm going to start with the Q and A button because uh, those came in while you were talking, Stephen. Yeah, um, yeah. So Christopher asks, how do you file unpublished contributions of freelance photographers? We know from one photographer that he would submit the entire roll of film for processing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we are doing is um, for unpublished materials, and there's a lot of it um, because oftentimes, um, a photographer would do an entire shoot and then they would develop the film and then they would just select maybe their top two or three images. And depending on um, the notoriety of the person, let's say Dr. King or Hank Aaron, um, oftentimes they just had um, their favorite images of them and they would just constantly run those photographs with whatever stories um, they were publishing about them in the magazines. So we have a ton of unpublished materials um, and as it relates to freelance photographers as well. And so what we are doing is being very cognizant to identify all the photographers as much as possible. Right now, um, we have a running list, which is close to about 500 photographers. Um, and so it is a lengthy process, but at the folder level, uh, we are identifying all photographers um, whose images appear in a folder. Um, there is a question from Caroline. And what, if any, are the most unusual items or formats you have completed? Or um, you have encountered so far? <laughs> yeah, unusual formats and items. Uh, the team is coming across interesting stuff all the time. Uh, for example, we just came across, uh, someone on the team came across a marriage certificate that was published. So that was unexpected. Um, we've also come across um, medical x-rays. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, so you never know. Oh, also we've come across, uh, we have a stamp collection that's actually in the archive. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so it's not just a photo collection. Um, there are all types of cool and interesting things. Young Hui asks, how are decisions made regarding the subjects, the subject headings um, used to describe the JPC archives? Were there any specific concerns about how to categorize materials and create finding aids in relation to the nature of the JPC archives? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we are maintaining the original subject headings that JPC created. Um, we are, we have initiated a process um, to do some, what we're calling conscious editing, uh, reparative description work to provide some alternative titles uh, to some JPC created subject headings that are potentially offensive, sensitive, and just kind of out of date. Uh, but we're not um, erasing the work that they've done because we think it does show um, really like how language changes and whatnot. Um, and so for discoverability and access, we are going to provide some more um, 
uh, appropriate uh, alternative titles, um, especially as it relates to um, people with disabilities, um, indigenous communities and whatnot. Richard asks, I'm reasonably close to retirement. Will you accept volunteers? Oh, that's a great question, Richard. And I wish the answer was yes, but unfortunately not. I'm sorry. Uh, we have more than enough work for quite a few volunteers, uh, but we're not accepting volunteers at this moment. Allison asks, thanks so much for the wonderful presentation. Do you have cold storage available for acetate negatives and other unstable media? Uh, not in the site that we are in currently, but both Namak and the GRI have cold storage. Uh, we have not come across um, any acetate negatives, knock on wood, um, but in the event that we do, we, we, we have a plan of action for them. Um, so yes. Bobby asks, have you come across any materials documenting agriculture or farming in African-American life? Yes, um, plenty, actually. Um, and oh God, I just looked at a photo today of um, a farmer, um, and I can't remember his name. Um, JPC did a really great job of <clears throat> covering farmers um, in their publications, especially in Ebony. Um, and so I would encourage you to check out um, Ebony on Google Books, which is free and open to the public. Um, if you have access to an EBSO, EBSCO subscription, that would be great um, because EBSCO actually has a full run of Ebony, whereas Google Books, they're only select issues, but um, farmers and agriculture is definitely represented throughout the collection. Lauren says, wonderful presentation, Stephen. I'd love to pick your brain sometime about how archive space records work, especially from a digital archives perspective. They're pro she or they are probably not alone in that. So tell us your thoughts there. Uh, <laughs> repeat the question again, Kate. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, loving to know more about how your um how how archive space records work, especially from a digital archives perspective. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so I'll admit, uh, so my previous employer did not use archive space, so that's actually been a learning curve for me to come into this role and have to um learn it uh, in order to do this work. Um, we're fortunate in the sense that there are uh, archive space administrators at the GRI that manage that for us. Um, and so my work is not as hands-on in that particular area, uh, but we are having some conversations right now, uh, just considering like all the different upgrade versions of archive space that are coming out and just some of the glitches that we're experiencing that I think everybody's experiencing, honestly, across the field. Um, and so feel free to reach out to me directly so we can uh, have that conversation because uh, I'd love to actually pick your brain. <laughs> Caroline asks, are there special considerations in offering digital access to images and materials related to individuals who are still alive? That's a great question. Um, so right now the plan of action is just to digitize everything. Um, we will at some point have a um, collection stewardship convening to really talk about a little bit more in depth about privacy concerns that living individuals may or may not have, um, especially as it relates to um, these images being online. So I have a question for you yeah. which is one of your early images was of this magnificent box with folders labeled eddie murphy sinbad jaleel white and i was basically transported back to being a child in the living room watching tv on friday night so can i ask you like have you come across anything in the archive where you just had this moment of pure pure fanish glee of oh my god here is this person and these images i've never seen before or something like that yeah um that happens a lot <laughs> that happens a lot and it's honestly something that you don't anticipate um until like the folder is in front of you and you're like oh let me just open this and so i'm a huge james baldwin fan um and so 
going through his images have been absolutely fantastic. Um, absolutely love Dionne Warwick and Diana Ross. And so looking at their images have been amazing. Um, today, uh, one of the archivists found a folder of Diane Carroll when, uh, in her younger years as a teenager. Uh, so that was really cool. So it's just, you never know um, what's going to find you. That's the way I want to put it, because oftentimes you are not looking for, for those photographs. They just kind of happen to show up, which is always pretty cool and neat and interesting. Um, my background is in vocal performance uh, music. So I'm always, always love finding or coming across images of um, Black composers and musicians and whatnot. And so uh, Marian Anderson's folder is absolutely fantastic of her home and her garden and her horses. And so, yeah, um, it really is. You can kind of just get lost in the collection. Uh, and so I try to give the team um, time so that they can like, you know, really kind of get lost in it and feel as though they're learning something rather than just doing the work because we got to get the work done. So there is time carved out um, throughout the day and the week for them to uh, just kind of discover and see and see what finds them. But I think which is also really important uh, just because there are so many different stories in the archive, so many unknown stories. Um, and so, you know, the archivists are always the first line of defense when it comes to reference. Kate, you know this. And so uh, they need to know what's in the collection. So um, yeah, discovery is really important to us and taking the time to just learn the materials. Yeah, and I just want to say like how much I appreciate you saying that you build in time for people to work and try to get to know the collections. That That, that is an ongoing challenge with anyone who has to work with large collections is just actually getting to know them. So mm -hmm. thank you on behalf of all of us for that. Um, Allison asks, what digital asset management system are you all using to store the digital content? That is a great question, Allison. Um, so the dams is actually um, the Smithsonian dams and I'm not familiar necessarily with what um, platform that is. Uh, but if you email me, I can find out and reach back out to you. Uh, with that answer. So I have another question for you, which is the flip side of my previous one, which is, have you come across anything where you're like, what do I, what do I do with this? And, and I, I mean that in the sense of, oh God, what do I do with this? And this comes from the perspective of one time when I was uh, processing a collection and um out pops a photo of the donor's wife in intimate apparel, shall we say. And we had this moment of, what do we do? Do we say, hello, would you like this back? What, what do you do when strange things happen? Yeah, that's that's actually a really great question. Um, so we um, So we recognize, right, in addition to JPC capturing like, the joy and the successes and achievements of Black life and culture, um, they're also capturing the flip side of that, right? Um, and so there are some um, just really potentially offensive and sensitive content throughout the collection. And so we have implemented a process where um, the team will flag photographs to be reviewed by uh, a subset of us. Um, and what we'll do is do research to see if the images were published in the magazines. If they were published, then we leave them in the main file. Um, and then we add a scope and content note saying, you know, folder includes photos that are potentially um, offensive and or sensitive, which depict graphic injuries or violence, you know. Um, and so that's the example of a note that we would use for the images of Emmett Till. Um, my first time seeing those images up close and personal, uh, I had a visceral reaction to them um, to the point where I had to like, you know, get up, walk outside, take a few deep breaths and then come back in. Um, and so we want to be cognizant that um, there are things in the collection that people may be uncomfortable with. Um, and so in the event that something, let's say that we flag for review has not been published, then we will um, place it to the side to be uh temporarily restricted until leadership has um, an opportunity to weigh in on it. Um, so we are trying to be as cognizant 
as possible. Um, and I should also add that on the finding aid, there will be a content warning. So um, those are just some of the things that <laughs> pop out at you. Um, and so some other categories um, that we are reviewing are um, images related to animal cruelty, um, as I mentioned, graphic injuries or violence, um, individuals in medical institutions or hospitals, um, as well as um, nudity, um, crime scenes, uh, deceased persons. Uh, so there is quite a lengthy list, um, but the staff has been phenomenal in terms of being uh, flagging those materials and us um, having an opportunity to review them. Thank you for that. Um, one thing that struck me while you were talking, I, I think all of us who have been archives in the room, and for those not archivists, you might not like see that. But on the flip side, coming across things like that, the you, you know we we put so much into thinking about how to protect audiences with, with trigger warnings and, and things, and the fact that when you were doing the raw pro processing, there there is nothing to protect the people who are the first encounters and. You know, we we can we we can run into to the stresses of that too. So thank you very much for you know talking about that. Um, I yeah. don't think that's one of those things we we talk about enough. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Ryan. What has it been like for the team to produce the finding aid in conjunction with the processing and digitization? Um, I think it's been great. <laughs> uh, because they are they all are um pulling out very cool things that they're coming across that will help populate the finding aid in terms of like what people can expect to see in the collection. Um, and for most of the team, you know, this is uh, their first professional job uh, out of grad school. And so they're really excited to be involved um, on a be involved in a project of this magnitude, but also um, they recognize the importance and the significance of the collection. And many of them already um, had experience processing either photographic collections or collections related to the Black experience. And so we are gearing up to start generating our finding aid um, before the holidays. Uh, and so um, the first task um, that I'm going to give the team is to find the finding aids that you really like and let's see and tell me why you like them um and then from there we're just gonna get going but uh i believe that they're enjoying the work <laughs> awesome um nicole asks and i believe this is following from our previous question how do you balance processing the materials while at the same time protecting and taking care of yourself um yeah that's a great question um so the team um, is aware that um, if they come across something that they are just uncomfortable processing, that they can let me know, um, that they can take a break, um, that they can just be forthcoming about what it is that they need, um, the type of support that they need. Um, considering the scope and the scale of the project, um, it is oftentimes really easy to kind of just get caught up in the, in the revolving door of the project. Uh, and so I, <laughs> this is actually a really great question because this week uh, during our team meeting, I asked everyone to just make sure that they were taking care of themselves physically and mentally um, and that they were drinking water and that they were taking as many breaks as possible uh, because with daylight savings time, you know, it's darker outside and uh, by the time we leave, it's pitch black here in Chicago. So um, it's really important for me that um, the team takes care of themselves as much as possible because this type of work, you can't rush it. Like you really have to be mindful and you have to be present. Um, and so that's of critical importance to me. Um, and so we have built in ample time within the project to really kind of accommodate for that. And so, um, so far, so good. Everyone is doing well. Everyone is drinking water and staying hydrated, uh, which is really important. Um, so yeah, I think we're in a good path. We're on a good path and a good pace. That is awesome. Um, another question from Richard, what sort of preliminary information about the existence of specific items, people, events files, not content, may be available to scholars now. Is there any provision for questions or are the doors shut completely until they are not? Yeah, that's a great 
question, Richard. So um, we have a active licensing program. Um, and so while the collection is currently closed to the public, um, researchers are able to request uh, permission to use images that appeared in Ebony and Jet. Um, as I mentioned, both magazines are available on Google Books and EBSCO. Um, and so that process um, just really entails submitting a request saying, hey, I'm interested in using this photograph, let's say, in a book I'm writing or for this production I'm working on. Um, and then we would do some research on our, our end to make sure that we uh, actually have the copyright to license that image. Uh, we do get quite a few requests um, throughout the year for um, licensing purposes. Um, the Emmett Till photographs, of course, being like the most heavily requested images. Thank you. Um, we appear to have gone through all of our questions. I'll give the audience a few minutes to think if, you know, going once, going twice. But I just really just want to like flail delightedly at, at you, Stephen. Like you were talking like so much about the guts of the archives world in what I think is an unusually accessible way. And that makes me just so incredibly happy because when we try to explain what we do in libraries and archives, sometimes it can be really difficult. And yeah. You're just doing it so smoothly that I'm just having like lots of envy, frankly. <laughs> what? Well, well, thank you, Kate. I think the photographs <laughs> help. <laughs> thank you. All right. Okay, I I think that might be it. Um, and you 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 have kindly said that you are happy to answer questions for for those who wish to talk yeah. further. Um, again, I can't thank you enough for uh, coming and talking to us this evening. It's been a real delight. Um, so just thank you. And again, I admire your respectability bookcase. It is gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> my, mine is nothing. So thank you so much. And I hope you have a great night. And I hope all everyone in the audience, wherever you may be coming from, also has a great night or morning or afternoon. Yeah. Um, and take care of yourselves, everyone. Yes, thanks, Kate. Have a good evening, everyone.